mini walking foots versus full size industrial walking foot sewing machines. Which one's better for the work that you do and which should you have in your workroom? Let's get into that topic today. Hi guys, I'm Willie Sandry. Today we're looking at two very different classes of walking foot sewing machines. You've got the portable version from Sailrite and the more traditional full-size industrial walking foot from Juki in this case. This is a Juki LU563, but other similar machines in this class would be the Juki 562, Conso 226 or 206 RB, or a FAF 145, 545, 1245. Those machines are all sort of upholstery weight sewing machines, but they can handle leather really nicely. The Sailrite walking foot was really designed um, through the yachting industry and the boating industry, and you can actually use this machine without electrical power. Just attach a handle here and you can sew without power, so conceivably you could make repairs on your sail. But what I want to see is if this sort of very compact mini walking foot can approach the level of capabilities of a larger walking foot for things like upholstery. Heavy fabrics, canvas, vinyl, and even leather. So these are the sorts of comparisons we're going to be making between these two machines today. So just a quick look at these two machines and some of the differences. We will start with the Juki. Now this is a full-size industrial walking foot. It happens to have a very large U-style bobbin on it, which is handy. I tell you, auto upholstery folks really like this machine because it's a long time before you run out of thread on that big bobbin, especially if you're using threads that are in the 92 weight size or even a little bit larger. Uh, for using thinner threads, like a 69 weight thread, uh, this would probably be overkill, but it certainly can still do it. Top loading bobbin on this sort of machine. Uh, we do have the walking foot mechanism. This one has a zipper foot on it right now, but it's compatible with standard walking feet, with zipper feet, with piping feet. You have various options for changing out the foot depending on what type of sewing you're doing. Um, this machine does require uh, regular maintenance in terms of hitting the oil spots every few bobbins that you sew. And it's a really sturdy, heavy, heavy duty machine for at least for upholstery class machines. And it sits inside of a table. In a minute, we'll look at the differences between the motors on these machines, but this will always live in a dedicated table. Usually they're about four feet long, so you do have to commit that space in your workroom. But this type of machine really can handle the thicker seams, and this is what I use for most of my upholstery product projects, whether it's a seat cushion, backrest cushion, um, you know, two, four, six, eight layers of vinyl or leather. I don't have an issue with this sort of machine. And so we'll go over and look at the Sailrite and see how some of the features compare. So the Sailrite's kind of a teaspoon size machine compared to the larger industrials, but it is a walking foot. So um, it has some of the capabilities that a typical domestic machine can't do. Uh, basically, that walking foot action is really good for climbing up over bulky seams and thicker layers. But I wanted to get in and test and see just what the upper limit of this machine is. And I mean comfortable upper limit. I don't mean something that you can sew over once. I mean something that you would be encouraged to do project after project and more or less have success with it. I don't want to take my machines past their natural limit and fight with it. I want to work well within their comfortable range. So this particular machine is an older model of Sailrite, very similar to what they're selling today. This has the, the clutch style side wheel and it has been upgraded with the monster wheel. 
a little more momentum here. Um, the wheel is larger in size than the old style uh, wheels that were painted the same as the body color, but they're actually, these monster wheels are actually the same dimension as the newer plastic wheels that come stock on some of the basic machines. Okay, so we'll make up some sample strips from leather for these tests that we want to do. We've got an inch and a half wide ruler to make up some piping strips for the seams that will have a piping type joint. So we'll make up a few of these and then we'll test both machines with various seams. And we'll cut some 4 by 12 inch panels to go along with the piping and to test various different seams for our test. Uh, so there's a big difference between just sewing, let's see, 30, 20, 18, here we go. If we're just sewing two pieces together, even of leather, you sew two pieces together with a simple blind seam, that's a lot different test for a sewing machine going through just the two layers and then opening it up to get your seam versus maybe you have piping and then you have an additional two layers of leather and then you got four layers of leather that's a little different test and a little more typical test but then maybe you come up to a strap that's got two or four more seams inside the cushion and so that becomes kind of the ultimate test for an upholstery machine so we'll see if we can get into that level but at minimum we'll be looking at plain blind seams, single fell seams and a piping type seam like this so that's a pretty good test of a sewing machine to see if it can go through four layers of two to three ounce leather okay so we'll go ahead and wind up some thread on the bobbin for the sail right we're using the same thread on both machines. It's a 92 weight, sometimes called a, a Tex 90, a bonded nylon. We'll wind it up. There's a little adjustment here. You can determine how much thread you'd like to have on your bobbin. For our purposes today, this will be just fine. Okay, so we had the hand wheel clutch mechanism disengaged to wind the bobbin. So to re-engage that, just twist it firmly clockwise. And then lightly hold the upper thread and go ahead and roll the hand wheel towards you. And you can pick up the lower bobbin thread. And just go ahead and pull that out with the scissors or a screwdriver. Top and bottom threads exposed now, we're ready to sew. Okay, you always want to hold back your threads when you start to sew. Make sure to put the presser foot down. That's kind of like rookie mistake number one is forgetting to put your presser foot down. Of course, that releases your upper tension and really no way to make a balanced stitch with your <laughs> presser foot up. So we'll spend a minute working in vinyl and setting our stitch length and just setting our tension. pretty easy to control the sail right does have a variable speed motor alright so we're getting a good balance stitch at least in these two thin layers of vinyl uh, let's do try though a little bit longer stitch length and see what that looks like You can, of course, hand wheel anytime you need to. A little bit longer stitch length there. Still making a nice balanced stitch. Now let's try uh, maximum width on our zigzag. And we should do that with the needle up. Maximum width on the zigzag. And then let's go to a little bit tighter, shorter stitch length here. And see what kind of pattern we can get with that. But the machine is doing a good job of feeding the material through on its own. 
you'll never find yourself having to pull the material through like you do with a domestic machine. Let's go ahead and just bury the needle and we'll pivot out of that. Let's go even a little bit shorter on the stitch length but maintaining the maximum zigzag width. This way you can really lay down some stitches as you go. I think I'm actually on zero stitch length here. Need to be at a little bit longer. There we go. So let's work through and we'll bury our needle and pivot out of that. There we go. Okay, so let's get to the underside here. We'll see what we're looking like with the underside of the zigzag. Um, in the vinyl thickness here, we are making a nice balanced stitch. There's no loose stitches or loops below. If that were the case, of course, if we had loose stitches below, you'd want to increase your upper tension. That's the most common problem you'll see with sewing is uh, upper tension is not tight enough. Um, worst case scenario, you've left, left your presser foot up where there's effectively zero tension. But if you don't have enough tension, you're going to get loose loops. That's true with any sewing machine, so dial in the basics first before we can really test the machine. Let's raise the needle up. We'll go to a straight stitch again, and we'll set our tension on two thin pieces of leather. Okay. So this is the same leather we'll be using for our test today. And we'll always go ahead and hold our threads back. Drop our presser foot down. And we'll establish good tension for this exact material we're using. You could set your tension in a lighter material. It wouldn't do you much good. You have to actually set the tension based on the exact leather or material that you happen to be using for your project. Reverse stitching. Alright, let's bury the needle, pivot out of there and have a look. Okay, so now we've got a very short stitch length. For leather, we want to increase the stitch length and that's just to maintain maximum strength when sewing with leather. So let's take a look at that when we increase our stitch length a bit. We'll pivot out of that and uh, I think I'm going to decrease the stitch length from there just a little bit. Let's have a look at that one. We'll go ahead and bury our needle and pivot out of that. Yeah, there's a reasonable stitch length. Eight or ten stitches per inch would be fine. So my stitch looks really good on the underside of the leather. Um, of course, for best results, you want to use a diamond point or what they call a leather needle. A round point will do fine, but if it really matters how it looks on the underside, you would want to have a, a leather needle. What I see, though, is some visible knots. Not every stitch, but some stitches have a visible knot on the top. And of course that means I've got too much upper tension. So I'll back that off slightly and we'll try again. Okay, let's have a look at that. Now that time I've almost got rid of all the exposed knots on the top of this. I think just another quarter turn and we should have it. I also like to try some reverse stitching. I bury the needle all the way and then slightly up on the forward rotation. Depress the reverse lever fully and reverse and you can see how close your forward and reverse stitches are to aligning into the same holes. So let's stitch forward again a little bit and we'll pivot out of that and have a look at our stitch quality. We've got it now on the top where all the knots are buried in the center of the material thickness and we haven't 
initiate, we haven't uh, created any problems on the bottom side there. So this looks good. And hey, if you're balanced in two layers of two thicknesses of leather, it's going to work fine in four. So just start with two layers of whatever material you want to balance the tension in. And if you can make it work in two layers, it's going to work great for your project. So let's go on to the test. Okay, so the first test in leather is going to be a simple blind seam. The challenge here for most sewing machines is not the thickness of the leather, but actually the friction between the suede side of the leather that is often down against the machine bed. And so let's see how the Sailrite does with just a simple blind seam, two layers of leather, and this is, you know, two and a half ounce upholstery weight leather. We'll hold our threads back and we'll get going. Take a minute to lock in your stitch. And we'll lock in the stitch at the other end too. Okay, find that release point a little bit forward from top dead center and we'll release this sample here and we'll see how we did. Okay, so the number one test of a seam is just try to destroy it and see what kind of strength you get. With this 90 weight thread um, that looks pretty good. I'm not getting much separation at the joint. Of course, a simple blind seam is not one of the strongest seams in upholstery. It's kind of the basic starting point, and usually there's some top stitching, or you'd have a piping in there to increase strength. So then, let's go ahead and lay a top stitch. Let's do a, let's do a single filled seam where we lay this off to one side and lay a top stitch and see how the sail right does with that. So now we've actually got one, two, three layers that we're trying to go through still in the leather. So sometimes that's a different story uh, for a domestic machine that might be able to do two simple layers of leather, but it may not be happy once you try to get up to three or more layers. So let's see how we do with the uh, single felled seam on the sail right. You want to kind of just open up your seam as you go, lay it flat a little bit. And you can just use the edge of the foot as a guide to know where you need to be. You don't need a magnetic guide in this case. You can see right where the edge of the foot is landing for a consistent stitch. And just be consistent. Roll it a little past the top dead center point, and we'll release our stitches. Okay, so obviously that increases the strength of the joint quite a lot. It looks like stitch length was fairly consistent. I don't see any shortening of stitch length. The classic sign that you're overtaxing your machine's capabilities is when you see intermittently shortened stitches. If your stitch length shortens, basically the feed of the machine is not doing its job. It's sitting there and trying to make extra stitches, but the feed is not pulling the leather through. And I don't see that sort of problem with this joint through three layers. Strength looks good and the stitch length is consistent and it certainly handled it so those are the big points with a single felled seam. Alright, let's see if the sail right is up for making a piece of making a piping strip in leather. So there is actually a small cording foot built in to this machine 
you don't have to use a separate foot just to do piping because there is a, a small foot built in small cord built into the foot but let's just see how that will do I think I may want to select my left position for this we'll just fold over our piping a bit and get started here holding back the threads always as we start all right now that we've got it started we'll concentrate on keeping our piping straight as we sew it closed. I noticed the uh, tunnel in the bottom of the cording foot is a little bit smaller than what you'd see for a normal industrial sewing machine. And so I'm just curious to see how that will manage the the piping once we get into sewing the seam. This is a 532nd inch cord and it's pretty standard for household upholstery applications. So we'll just sew down the length and we'll have our piece of piping for our test sample. Okay, so we'll sew up a strip of piping with some 530 seconds cording. Hold our threads back and we'll get underway. Align our edges and sew down the length of piping. Okay, we'll just sew down the length of the seam here with piping in the middle. Four total layers of leather here. Just keeping the edges aligned as we go. The machine doesn't bulk too much at the thickness it seems to have good punching power but the issue is just can you get this the thickness under the presser foot that seems to be the challenge with the smaller machine we reverse and lock in our stitch there Roll the needle up top dead center and just beyond. We can release out the material here. Okay, so it was able to sew it. I don't like some of the inconsistencies in the seam I see here. Here the, the piping projects out further on this end. It doesn't project enough in the middle and then it looks fat again at the end. So just general challenges I had with the machine trying to sew a simple uh, seam up with piping. I think it's just due to being right at the machine's limit. No machine's going to perform well if you're taking it right to its, the limit of its capability. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get the full-size industrial threaded up. 
you just want to come through two of the post holes barber pole around the guide three times hold your thread wrap through the tension discs up through the controller until it clicks guide take up arm right to left guide 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 needle bar guide and then threading the needle left to right okay so we can go ahead and spin the hand wheel around and pick up the lower thread I like this on these machines because you can see exactly what's happening these top loading bobbins it gives you a little view into the hook area well okay on this machine I've actually got a spool of 530 seconds piping right below I do a lot of piping with this machine and it's useful just to have it right on hand with this machine we also want to hold the threads back as we start to sew and we'll go ahead and make a strip of piping here and you can notice the sound this machine makes it's just really quiet in operation these uh, older Japanese solid metal machines are just something to behold even the new versions that are have similar capabilities as this machine are to my ears they're a little noisier might just be the tolerance in the manufacturing and machining of the parts but So this is the sort of machine that I'm used to and I'm comparing the mini walking foot to. Is it a fair apples to apples contest? No, but that's not the point. I'm looking at a bowl of fruit and seeing which one I want to have. So some people knock comparisons that aren't straight across even comparisons, but to me, um, you're looking at a similar price point for the comparable version of this machine is no longer made, the 563. But a comparable machine in an upholstery class would be a Conso 206 RB5. And that's about the same cost as a new Sailrite that's well equipped. So in that respect, it is a reasonable comparison you just need to figure out what's more important to you the the power and the capacity versus portability for some people it may come down to hey do they have the space for a big dedicated sewing table or maybe you already have another table dedicated to a domestic machine and so the question would be do you have room for a second machine this machine has a servo and a speed reducer it's really got extra power too all right well we've got our piping sewn up and we'll sew the seam next I think I do want to increase my stitch length a little bit. I'll just bring a scrap of leather in to do that. On this machine you just press a button down on the bed and roll the hand wheel towards you to increase stitch length. That would be a little too much. We'll set it right in there. See what that looks like. That'll be fine, eight or 10 inches. 
eight or ten stitches per inch and it's fine for leather. Okay, so we're right back at it. Let's say then this was our sample project. This one I only had two straight edges. Let me get the right one. There we go. So we just place our piping between the two panels and I have much more room to work with to get that under the foot. Um, it, it just kind of feels like a fight if you can't get the thickness of your project under the foot. Uh, so that's one thing I was struggling with with the smaller machine. Um, but in this case you don't have that problem. We've got our stitch length set the way we want. We'll hold our threads back and I'll take the time to go ahead and lock in the stitch here. I think speed control is pretty good on both machines. Like I said, this has the servo, variable speed servo, as well as a box style speed reducer. And so that's kind of the ultimate combination of power and um, speed control. So a lot of people find that they, if they just have a servo, that's enough. But for me, I do a lot of work with leather, and so I wanted to have a servo as well as that speed reducer. And that's been the ideal solution for me. With the Sailrite, you actually do have variable speed. I guess it's a point I mentioned because on a lot of industrial machines, uh, especially the old-fashioned ones, you'll have a clutch-style motor that's basically just on or off and they hum so fast that you don't have great control and if you're shopping for a full-size industrial the way to tell if it has a clutch motor is when it's powered on but not sewing does it make any noise so here my machine is off and here it's on there's no ambient noise to the machine until I sew it's just smooth mechanical noise and that, that's what you get with the servo. A clutch is different. Um, as soon as you turn a clutch motor on it will start humming and making noise and that, that bothers some people. But just look at how consistent the look of the piping is. I didn't struggle one iota to make that seam. I have even reveal all the way along my sample seam here for this 530 seconds piping. And that's what I want when I'm using large panels of leather that I don't want to see go to waste. Okay. Okay, so let's give this sail right a fair shake with something you'd be more apt to use it for, like a home deck project, making pillows with piping maybe comes to mind. So we'll have our needle set in the center position straight stitch, medium stitch length, and we'll just uh, sew up some piping to get started here. Hold our threads back like always and see how the Sailrite does with just your lighter fabric and home deck projects. Yeah, I think we're ready to make some mileage here.
Okay, so this is 532nd piping, just like with the leather project. And this is um, home deck style upholstery fabric, medium weight. This is something you'd use to make a pillow, throw pillow for your couch. So we've got four layers of it there. Let's see how that goes with the sale rate. I do feel like I'm fighting again to get that thickness under the foot. There's a certain position where the, the feed dogs start to go down just a little bit and if you take the time to roll it to that position just before the needle comes in the way of the fabric, um, that might be the sweet spot to get the most clearance. Don't forget to put your foot down and uh, get your stitch started and back tack it. And then we'll see how it does running down a seam here. keeping things aligned as we go. It's really doing pretty good with that. This is right up the Sailrights Alley. Okay, we'll get you a little closer and have a look at that seam. So the stitch length looks real good in the home deck fabric. And opening it up, we see consistent piping just like you'd normally expect. The seam feels strong. I wouldn't have any concerns about that. For a couch reupholstery or throw pillow for the house. So if you keep the sale right in its comfort zone and don't try to max it out, I think it can be a capable little machine and it can probably do quite a lot more than a, a typical domestic machine because of the walking foot. Main limitation I'm seeing is clearance under the foot. The interesting thing is it actually will lift up beyond the hand lift position. It only goes that high, but when pressed, it can lift a little higher. And so you could actually just manually lift that if you were on a seam or a particularly thick area to get started. But that is one thing you'll fight is getting thick materials started under the machine. So in the final analysis of a portable walking foot versus a full industrial walking foot, I think the differences are clear, you know. Uh, just look at the motor. Um, this is the motor here on the portable walking foot. It's got a 75 watt motor. Uh, one of the smallest motors you can get for an industrial machine is a 550 watt servo motor like the one here. Um, it's a really good way to power an industrial sewing machine, really good control that way, but 75 watts versus 550 watts on the low end of the scale, you're just going to have a lot more power with a full size industrial machine. Beyond that though, I mean if you keep this machine in its comfort zone, in its wheelhouse where you're doing canvas, jean hemming, home deck, a little bit of light upholstery with material. Hey, you'd probably be fine and you'd probably do a lot better with a walking foot, portable as it may be, than you would do with a domestic machine. But if you want to do heavy duty upholstery and especially leather upholstery, you'll be looking at a full size industrial sewing machine, particularly a walking foot. I hope some of this information helps you and thanks for watching.